we are live. Okay, cool, 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 cool. It is 10.30 in the morning. It is way too early. Um, <laughs> I've been on that nighttime schedule. I don't know about anybody else. Um, yeah, I guess I would just want to say good morning to everybody. Um, how was designing last night? Anybody stay up super late working on things? Uh, just post in the chat. There's like a 15 second delay, so I'll, re I'll read it when it comes up. Um, but I want to thank you guys for coming out to this morning's talk. Um, the main purpose of today's talk is to talk about the rubric, uh, give some basic guidance as to uh, how to do an online presentation, how to sort of, you know, put yourself out there and deliver this, you know, kind of hackathon online presentation type of experience, um, you know, where you're going to be in a booth and there's going to be minimum three judges coming around and you're gonna have five minutes to talk. So I think the first thing that I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna start off by sharing the rubric. So everybody has this rubric. There should be no kind of questions in terms of what you are being judged on. Um, this is what we are giving the judges. This is what we are using for the scoring. To talk a little bit about how we judge, um, typically, before any of the judging happens, about an hour beforehand, we're sitting down with every single one of our judges and walking them through a talk pretty similar to this one, where we go through the different points on the rubric, we look at previous submissions, we talk about what they did good, what they could have improved on, and how that relates to the scoring. So I'm going to talk through these various points and just sort of reflect on um, one of the problem statements that we have. So I've just chosen to do the Indian one, um, just because uh, this one is a little more complex. And so I wanted to kind of go through that. Uh, I don't actually have the Figma brief. One sec. Here, we'll do the LeapGrad one, because I know I have their PDF on hand. Um, so we're going to talk through the LeapGrad one, talk about, about what all of these different aspects uh, represent. And wow, I am really struggling with like getting a half piece of PDF up. Okay, it's my palette today. We're using my palette because um, all the other ones were super, super funky. Um, this is an older one that I just have on hand, um, but it'll work for today's purposes. So the rubric. First thing that we're marking you on is the color scheme slash theme. So when talking about the color scheme slash theme, um, some of our companies are married to their colors and some of the companies that are here this weekend are not. So when it comes to people that are relatively married to their colors, um, what? Oh, I, I'm being told that, uh, I am really zoomed out right now. My apologies, everybody. Uh, this should make things a little bit better. And you all have this brief in, um, the folders. You guys all have this rubric. Um, let's see, is that a little bit better? Okay, that's good. Um, so you have one for the app, one for the website, depending on whether you're mobile or web. Either way, it's pretty much the same marking. There's very little tweaking um, between the two. So um, companies that are married to their theme slash color this weekend, um, Leapgrad and My Palette are both relatively married to their color scheme slash theme. So when I say this, uh, I'm going to pull up the My Palette brief so everybody can kind of see what that looks like. Um, so for My Palette, what we mean by theme and what we mean by the color scheme really is the color palette, or in this previous version, hex values. So these are the different colors that we should be seeing in your design. It doesn't mean these have to be the only ones that we see in your design, but your design should center mostly around these colors. You can take a little bit of artistic liberty and whatnot with it, but mainly stick to these. Um, in terms of the lettering, right? Um, you know, no one is particularly married to any typography, um, but keep the same theme, right? If you're seeing clean, minimal, pick a font that is also clean and minimal. Don't pick something that's like super uh, wavy and curly. Um, so back to the rubric. Uh, this is for both. Okay, same deal with typography. Um, actually, going back to color, sorry. Um, Inviant is not married to their color scheme. They are really open to new themes, new schemes. Um, so 
definitely toy around with that. Try to stick to the basic colors that we've outlined in the brief, but feel free to play with hues and shades and tweak it a little bit. Uh, one of the comments that we got from Kishav was that it was very um, intense. It's a very intense color scheme. Uh, and so he, he was hoping that we could maybe, you know, pretty it up a little bit. Um, so in terms of the typography, um, again, no one is super, super married to anything in terms of typography, but keep the same style. So, you know, we really shouldn't be seeing any super, super wavy letterings. Um, you know, most of our brands, uh, try sharing browser window. Is it still not, still not looking all right? I don't know what's up with this. The screen sharing was working great yesterday and now it's like, not. <laughs> um, yeah, this, no, you guys are seeing the same thing that I am. There's just that empty space there. I, my, my team is messaging me in the back trying to fix it. It's like, it looks fine. Um, okay. So the typography, again, most of the fonts that we're seeing from our various um, sponsors this weekend, you know, sans serif, minimal, um, very clean right? No one's using a lot of very heavy serif fonts or, um, you know, wavy lettering, anything that's kind of uh, fun or funky like that. Um, navigation. Okay. So one of the most important things um, when it comes to UI UX design is already, people are already trained, right? You use apps all day, use websites all day. There's certain spots that you know where to look and there's certain functionality you need to keep in mind. So this first point is going to hit on mobile. The majority of people on their phones are right-handed. Just as a rule of thumb, most people are right-handed and they use their they use their phones with their right hand. Now I, I have a big old phone here. Um, one thing to notice when you are using your phone, there is only a small region right here here where you can one hand touch, right? And that's with most phones. The farther up you put UI elements, the more difficult it is for a one-handed user to reach them. That's why if you look to a lot of um, newer websites, so Slack, for example, you'll notice that before, especially if you were using apps and whatnot, probably 10 years ago, right? Um, a lot of stuff was always at the top because that's where we put it for websites. Um, you know, and if you look at your web browser, your tabs are probably at the top, but if you're moving to more and more recent um, apps or mobile web browsers, like on your phone, you'll notice that your navigation stuff is all at the bottom. Why? Because it's a lot easier to tap down here than it is to slide the phone and reach up here something to keep in mind while you're doing the navigation. How easy is it for your user to click and go where they want to go? The next one is hamburger menus. So hamburger menus, super, super popular. Not a big fan personally, because it buries your stuff under clicks. They have their place. Um, but the main thing is for hamburger menus, it's a little confusing right now. You're seeing some places move to put their menus on the bottom because again, that, that accessibility on mobile, um, but you're also seeing organizations that put their um, menus either on the top left or the top right. So there's no particular place to put them. The one thing that I'm gonna say is if you go on YouTube, there is a talk, um, oh, I can't remember who it's by, but he talks about better ways to do navigation besides the hamburger menu. Um, so some places it might be really appropriate, but a lot of the time people just default to that menu. And so I highly encourage people to look outside of that and go beyond that. Um, yes. And this kind of ties into that concept of how easy is it to find the page, the number of clicks, the title markers, um, you know, how, how do you get around, right? Does it take a billion different clicks to get somewhere? or does it only take a handful? The less clicks, the better. The problem is the less clicks you have, the more stuff you have on the surface level. So when we look at the Invian problem, their issue is it's super overwhelming. 
you go on and you're like, what is this? I have no idea what's going on. In that case, maybe it's a good idea to bury some stuff under clicks, you know, have them in drop down menus, have them in hidden menus. But when it comes to something like my palette or leap grad, you want a lot of those features right at the surface where people can get to them really, really quickly. And you're not necessarily as worried about overwhelming your user just because there isn't as many components going on because uh, the use case is different. So what I would say in terms of that is um, think about your clicks and count them. Actually take the time to count the clicks it takes to do a function. And if you have spots where you are double or triple clicking to get to something, see if there's a way you can cut a few of those. Um, while still keeping a lot of that cohesive structure you're looking for. Um, and then talking about um, the app, again, put your menus, put your bars in places that make sense and try to keep it as effectual as possible. Meeting the needs of the client. Read the brief. <laughs> that is the biggest thing that I can say because the brief is meant to not only give you an idea of the question, but it's also meant to give you an idea of the company, the image that they're putting forward, the colors that they want, um, and sort of aligning your style to that. So for example, if, you know, one of the big things for LeapGrad is video, 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 video first, video all the time, you know, think TikTok, right? All you see is video. They want to be able to go deeper, but that is the big, big thing for them, right? So if you do, an app that is totally text-based, that's not meeting the needs of the client, right? And if your app is text first, video second, that's not really meeting the needs of the client either. So this, this point really comes down to, did you read the question? Did you understand what the question was asking? And did you deliver what the question was asking? Um, and this kind of applies to both. Um, consistency. So this is a technical component. You know, when it comes to the navigation, that is UX. Meeting the needs of the client is understanding the question. Color scheme, theme, a little bit technical, but you're kind of mostly given that same with typography. But consistency is a technical design component. So what do I mean by this? We're looking at hierarchy of design, and we are looking at things like alignment, you know. So for example, if you have a bunch of elements that you know, you have like left align, left align, middle align, left align, middle align, left align, right? That that feels very discontinuous, right? Maybe it would make a little bit more sense to have everything left aligned and then just have those other two elements pushed in a little bit. Or when it comes to, um, you know, looking at your images and whatnot, uh, you know, are they super stretched and distorted and they don't look great? Or have you scaled them appropriately and put them in, you know, the appropriate aspect ratio? Uh, when you're looking at your icons, right? right are those, do they make sense? Um, and, th and this is talking about actual um, elements, but then there's also the concepts of, you know, readability, right? Black on white text is standard for a reason. It's probably the best contrast and easiest format to read. But if we go here, right, I, we're just looking here at this blue box. Alex, if I change this text color to gray, right, you can't read that. It's really, really hard to read that. Now, there's certain styles that use this. Newmorphism specifically is a really good example. Um, some people are trying to make that a trend. I'm still not sold on newmorphism. Um, but, like, this is really, really hard to read. So you have to look at your contrast. Right. You also have to look at your coloring. So blue on yellow is pretty readable, but the minute that you start getting like red on yellow, now it gets really hard on the eyes. And then you go to something like light blue on yellow and you can see like it's almost searing how intense these colors are. And so the main thing that we're looking for when it comes to consistency, you know, hierarchy of design, alignment, um, you know, do, are you using the same fonts for everything? Well, not necessarily the same fonts, but like, do you have paragraphs that are like 11 point, 12 point, 10 point, 11 point, 12 point, you know, you're varying small things like that. 
keep those consistent because that makes it a lot easier or makes it easier on the eyes and just helps to maintain consistency throughout the theme. I'm going to go into questions right now, see if anyone is posting anything. Um, okay. Uh, no problem, Jeff. Can you zoom in? Thank you for zooming. Uh, you should all have, okay. So rubrics are dropping at one. My bad. I thought they were all included in the folder. Um, so if you're good, I'm going to keep going. Um, I know this is like a slow talk, but I really want to make sure people understand. So if you have questions about what I'm saying and, or it doesn't make sense, or you want more detailed explanations, please post, right? This is really just to help you guys go through and understand what we are asking of you. Um, again, so remember what I was saying about placements, right? When it came to the hamburger menus, when it came to your search bar, again, and same thing applies to other aspects of your design. If you need something, right? Like one of the big components is, for example, the search bar on my palette. If you bury that under three clicks, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Or if you turn that search bar to be vertical on like the right hand side, interesting design, not sure if it makes a lot of sense. Um, and so when it comes to that, it's all about where you are placing stuff, not only to interact with, but also visually, right? So Inviant, big thing for them, data, 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 right? They want the visualization, they want the visualization front and center. Don't put the data visualization at the bottom of the page. Don't put it where I have to scroll to it, right? Put elements that are important right at the top. So an example of this, even if you look at the previous Invian design, they have their three parameters right at the very top, right? Those three parameters are essential to everything else happening in the app. That's why they're at the top. They're the first thing you see, the most important thing that you can use to fine tune and tweak. It wouldn't have made sense if they put that at the very bottom. So think about where you are laying things out and think about where you are placing things. Um, okay, and then aesthetics. How does it look? Does it feel right? Are there glitches? You know, this is very much, um, you know, where your artistic abilities come in, in terms of kind of UI layout and feel and just general usage. Um, and so now we're going to move to the UX components. So even in these UI components, right, we talked about a few different items that could be considered UX, but it all ties together. The concept of UI and UX are separated at birth. You do your UX portion, usually by hand, however you do it. You do your UI portion, usually by hand, however you do it. But when it comes to combining these into a prototype, they inform one another very, very directly. So when it comes to this rubric and the way that things are being marked, know that decisions in what you might consider a UI component may very well affect your decisions when it comes to a UX component in that final prototype. Now, it doesn't necessarily affect how you guys are being marked on the planning and things like that, but when it comes to the final design, just know that these really do inform each other. And so remember what I was saying in terms of um, typography, theme, um, and just aesthetics, right? It, these all tie together. They also tie together with accessibility because if you're placing stuff on top of each other, you're making things hard to read, um, you're using low contrast, right? These are all elements where it doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's also when it comes to accessibility, you know, do you have everything buried on different pages? If you have 20 different pages on your website, it's really hard to navigate, you know? So consider maybe doing a one pager, right? The, the Invian app is just a one pager. It doesn't go anywhere else. It doesn't redirect anywhere. It's purely just on one page. Um, so you can consider maybe doing that to prevent having to link out to other things. And when it comes to actual web design, you have load times and things like that. So the more you can keep people on a single page without having it be overly long tends to be the better choice. Think of your pages as different books. So 
when you read a book, you have your chapters, you have your paragraphs. So a paragraph could be a bullet point, right? Could be a set of bullet points, could be some text on an image, right? They are one item. They might be parts within them, but they're all one item. Kind of like how sentences are part of paragraphs. When it comes to your chapters, those are your sections of your website. So if I'm designing a personal site, I have the landing page, I have the about me, I have the personal projects, you know, you have these different sections. These are your chapters. Your books are your pages. So on a personal site, if it's only about me and about what I've done, and I don't have tons and tons and tons of content, maybe I'm just going to do one page and that's going to be my book. Maybe I'm super, super involved in research. And so I, I think, okay, maybe it makes a sense to have a book about me and then a book about my research. And so you'd have two separate pages. You might have your own personal page and then you might redirect to your research page where it talks about all the different research and things that you've been involved with. Same as, you know, if you're an artist, for example, you might have your one book, which is you, what you do, you know, how to freelance and hire you. And then you might have your gallery, which is all the stuff that you've done before, people you've worked with before, how to hire you, right? So there's elements that might be common between the two, but you have these separate books, you know, very, very separate in their purpose, essentially different pages, different purposes. Um, user control. So this is talking about the interactions that you have. Do they make sense? So when we're looking at um, buttons, for example, right, you want people to select three options. Don't use a radio button, you know, or use a multi-select button. And, but don't use items that we expect to only be for one click. So if you're picking of a list of 10 and you want people to pick like three of them, radio boxes may not be the best choice. I'd say probably check boxes. That would be my go-to when it comes to your buttons, right? Does it make sense to have individual buttons, have them as part of a list, have them as part of a grid, you know, thinking about how you lay these out where they make sense for your drop downs, you know, does it make sense to even have a drop down in the first place, or does it make sense to have all the elements on the top level? Um, you know, when you're looking at your drop down, how do you distinguish that you are in a drop down um, versus that you aren't? So, common ways you might see that you might see that there's a color that extends down. Uh, you might see, um, yeah, colors that extend down, shadows that appear, different colored text, um, various ways that you can distinguish that you are in certain parts of the app. You know, for notifications, use standard behaviors. Green is good, red is bad, right? That's just fundamental. Stoplights, you know, <laughs> like UI design. And think about it, whenever an app, let's say you enter a password wrong, what behavior would you expect? I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna, I, I want some people to post in the chat to see, like I, I'm entering a password on an app. What might you expect that app to do when I enter the wrong password. In terms of structuring the pitch, we're going to get to it. And right now I'm just really, really focusing on talking you guys through this rubric and making sure that everybody kind of understands what we're looking for. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not seeing any answers in the chat. So I guess I'll keep going. Um, when it comes to an app project me, right? I might expect maybe the box shakes. Maybe there's an X or something that appears that says wrong password or incorrect password. Um, you know, it probably clears the box to show me again. Um, you know, so there's various ways that you can show that interaction. Um, so yeah, that's user control, cross-platform connectivity. Do you link to other things? You know, if you have a button that says Facebook, does it link to Facebook? If it says Twitter, does it link to Twitter? you know, just the, these basic interactions that sometimes get forgotten, but are really important to be remembered. Um, if you have links on your website, 
How are you showing that it's clickable? How are you showing that it's a link? Um, stability. Um, so when it comes to this, this is more about your transitions in your mockup. So does it make sense? Does it run pretty efficiently, right? Do you have really, really long animations? Maybe a really, really long animation makes sense, but if I have to sit through that really long animation seven times, I'm gonna be getting annoyed at it. So thinking about your transitions, your animations, you know, do they make sense? Are they smooth or do they frustrate your user? Um, so just thinking about how you go about doing that as well as are there any bugs in them? So in mockup software, you know, you can have some issues with transitions. So just making sure that they run smoothly. There's no glitches. There's no errors, you know, between your artboards, nothing is shifting, right? Um, and just keeping that consistency across the whole prototype. Um, remember what I was saying about entering a wrong password, responsiveness to error. Have you thought of all these external conditions where something doesn't work right? Something is not perfect. Something needs to be reloaded. Something needs to be fixed. You want to see that you are thinking of these in both your wireframes, um, in your uh, user flow diagrams, and in your final prototype. So we are really looking to make sure that you have all these components. Um, in addition, right, you've thought of these errors. We want you to show us that you've thought of the er these errors. We also want you to um, make sure that there's safeguards in place. So for example, you know, an email thing, if you don't enter an email, might say, you know, not a valid email, um, you know, not a valid password, um, you know, link, making sure that none of the links or anything like that are broken on your app, right? Because if you go to present to us and suddenly a bunch of your artboards aren't linked, then that to us is something that we deduct points for. Um, and then final components of the rubric before I get to uh, tips for the presentation. And then at the very end, I'm just going to showcase previous designs. Um, professionalism, right? How does it look? How does it feel? Is it polished? You know, a lot of the companies that are here, right? They are pretty far along in their process. Like these are not like startups with nothing behind them. These are, you know, startups that either have customers are getting customers or actually have like full on clients that they're working with. So when it comes to the companies that are here this weekend, right, a lot of them are looking for a very professional feeling product, um, you know, and then that also kind of ties into, is it actually like pleasant to use or does it hurt my soul? <laughs> um, you know, oh, and just in general, how does it work? How does it feel? Does it feel good? Design creativity. You know, we want unique solutions. We want unique ideas. So even if you try something and it doesn't work, we still want to reward you for trying. And that doesn't mean that if you just follow exactly what they wanted, you won't get any marks um, in this category. It is more so a way of rewarding people that have come up with something like unique and innovative within their design. Um, and then the planning, right? So how has it been planned? You know, show us your sketches, show us your wireframes, show us your user flow diagrams, show us everything. It is better for you to show stuff and, you know, oh, I'll be like, okay, skip it, move on, than to not have put it in in the first place. Uh, and finally, creativity bonus, right? This is something that we award for something in the design that we think is really creative. So maybe it's a super creative image or it's, you know, super creative logo. Maybe it's a really interesting uh, use of text or layout, you know, anything that we're like, that, that's actually like pretty creative. Uh, you know, that's something that we award those as a bonus point for. So when looking at, um, I'm going to share the next screen. Um, so this slide deck is getting rearranged a little bit because I am going a tad slower than I thought I would. Um, the main stuff I want to hit on now. Um, oh, yes. And final thing, there is, like, just to reiterate, because I've, I've been trying to say it all weekend, no code. We are not awarding any marks for code. 
Um, so you can write a website, you can do a Wix website, you can do a React website, however you want to do it. Um, but we will not be marking that code, which is why we highly, highly, highly encourage you to use tools like Figma, like Adobe XD, like Sketch to sort of go through and mock up these various apps and websites without having to write code. It's a lot faster and a lot easier to sort of iterate and fail upon to you get a design that is really, really good rather than having to tweak code. Because as someone that's like done some website stuff in the past, it can be very uh, frustrating because you'll get little things that don't work and it takes a lot of time. Okay. Um, presentation tips. Number one, remove distraction. So you can see around me, right? Big view of my room. Make sure that you don't have tons of stuff on the floor. Make sure you don't have just, you know, like a huge mess behind you. If you have pets, maybe try to tuck them away. If you have siblings, maybe try to also tuck them away. Um, you know, so this is for that final presentation. Try to remove um, distractions like your phone, messages, other sites that are open on your computer. This will make it a lot easier for you to focus on that five minute pitch. You're going to be presenting a minimum of three times for five minutes each. Um, next, we have camera position. So this is a personal choice as to whether you want your camera. Um, the big thing is how are you framing yourself? So my camera sits on top of my monitor. The main reason I do this is because I gesture a lot with my hands. I'm someone that talks with my hands. So the one thing that I'm going to encourage, even if you aren't someone that talks with your hands, is push your camera back a bit. The biggest issue with online stuff is it can feel kind of claustrophobic. You'll sometimes get people and they get really, really close to their camera and it starts to make you a little uncomfortable. Um, this thing's fish-eyed, so it's not as bad, but you'll get people that are like, really, really close to their camera. So what I'd highly encourage you to do is just push back a little bit, put a little bit of separation between yourself and the camera. And you'll find that it becomes a lot less of talking to a screen. And you're more so talking directly to sort of the camera and everyone there. Because the closer you are to your screen, the more of a tendency you have to look down at yourself and to look at what you're doing. So I highly encourage put a little bit of distance, Try to put the camera either slightly above you or at eye level. You know, try not to have the camera beneath you because the angles are just not as flattering. You know, so if you have to put a bunch of like books or textbooks or pots and pans um, to bring it up a little bit, definitely um, feel free to do that. Uh, okay, these two go hand in hand. Practice, slow things down. You have five minutes. It's not a lot of time. But the minute that you really start talking to speak faster and faster and faster and faster and really starts to get confusing and you're like, hey, look at this component, look at this component, you start to scramble your words, you start to speak too fast, it becomes really hard for people to understand you. So slow down, you have more time than you think you do. This also ties into practice. Make sure that you are practicing beforehand. Work with your team, flesh things out, um, and sort of go through those different aspects. Um, Next, budget your time. So one of the most important things is while you are practicing, figure out how long you're spending on these different components and compare them to what they're worth in the rubric. Don't spend the entire time showing me just your wireframes and never show me your prototype. There's a lot of marks that are much more weighted towards the prototype than they are the wireframe. Budget your time, make sure you know where you are spending your time and make sure you are spending it wisely. This also goes into that. Give the judges, the prototype at the start. The first thing that you should do before doing anything else is giving everybody the prototype. Be like, yeah, here is the link to our prototype. That way people can open up the Figma, people can open up the XD, and they can start looking around and start tinkering with it. Because a lot of the marks here are for us actually going through the app, seeing what you did. So while you are talking and sort of, you know, oh, sharing what you did this weekend, give your judge a chance to click through the presentation and, or sorry, the, the, uh, the prototype, just so that they can get a feel for it and they can start, you know, informing themselves on those marks because the sooner that they are clicking through, the sooner they can start asking questions related to the rubric in terms of, you know, making sure that they're giving everyone as many marks as they can. 
you know, because we want to reward you for all the effort that you've put in this weekend. We're not looking to cheat everyone out of marks. So when it comes to being judged, get your prototype to them as early as possible. And then final point for the presentation, understand that this is new for everyone, right? If this is your first time doing an online presentation, it kind of is for me too. Um, you know, it, it's different. It's new for everybody. You just sort of roll with the punches. If there's tech issues, slip up, things don't go perfect. That's okay. The main thing that I kind of want to make sure is that everybody is, you know, enjoying the event, enjoying the presentation. Don't think of it as being super, super stressful, right? This is not about like, am I the best UI UX designer ever? At the end of the day, the one thing that we really, really want to promote at this event is the showcase of your work. That's why every company that we are involved with this weekend is looking to, well, in terms of the question specifically, is looking to bring on new team members, right? Either in paid positions or volunteer positions. A lot of our other sponsors, they either want people using their software, uh, they want people involved on, you know, involved in these types of activities, or they just generally want to see people succeed in this field. And so I really want to stress to everyone that the presentation is about showcasing your work. And on top of that, I really encourage everyone to check out what everyone else has been doing, right? Because it might be you and your team all weekend, but there's a whole bunch of other teams that have also been doing stuff. So go see what they've been doing. Go see what they've been up to. You know, I think that's probably one of the most valuable things you can do as a designer is see what everyone else has been working on and pull from their designs in the future. Um, submission tips. So in the briefs, it outlines what you need for all the submissions. At the end of the day, the most important things you're planning. So user flow, wireframes, any planning stuff that you've done include. Don't include it just in the submission, include it in the PowerPoint, include it in the video, put it in places that we are probably going to see it. We next have the video that I was talking about. We want to see you clip through your prototype. You can either close caption it or you can narrate it, um, you know, or you can even just do a standard version, but I highly recommend either the narration or close captioning. Um, and that is really for us to be able to showcase these designs to people. So actually being able to say like, this is what people did at this competition. And this is something you put on your personal site. Like, hey, this is an app I designed at the UI UX Designathon. Here, here's a quick look at how it interacts. And then finally, uh, we also want your raw files. So these are your Figma files. These are your XD files. Um, the reason that we are asking for these is that last year we had a few submissions that came in in formats we couldn't really read. And that was a bit of a pain. So this year, we're asking that you also submit those files for us, um, just so that if there's any issues with the video or the formatting or anything like that, we can still click through and go through the prototype, as well as take a more detailed look um, in terms of, you know, how things are actually aligned and really kind of going in depth on some of those choices. Um, and so next point, um, actually, first point, really, list everything you need in the design submission. Create a big old list and then tick off the stuff that you have done. Don't leave it to the last minute. Don't leave it to the final seconds. Start with this list and work through it. This will help to inform everything and make sure you don't miss anything. Make our lives easy, right? Put stuff in the video, put stuff in the PowerPoint, places that we are going to see it. And also make sure that when you are submitting things, put them in stable formats. You know, give us the PowerPoint, sure. Also give us the PowerPoint as PDF. Why? Because if the PowerPoint doesn't look right on someone's computer or something, we can pull up the PDF at the end of the day. You know, don't give us a, like an iMovie file. Don't give us, you know, like an, an editable file. Give us something that has been exported into a final format like an MP4. You know, so don't give us like project files like that. Um, you know, make sure you give stuff that is exported in a final format. Um, submit well before the deadline. So what I'm going to say about this is everyone is going to be submitting at 11.59. Try to submit at least at 11.55, <laughs> you know, submit a little bit beforehand. That way, when everything is burning, because there's like all these people trying to submit at once, you know that your stuff is in nice and safe. Um, and then finally, 
read the brief, right? We've prepared these briefs. We worked with the companies to prepare, prepare all of this. These briefs have lots of really good info in them. Don't just quickly browse through them. Really take the time to unpack it and you'll pull a lot of really good info for that. And then final point for submission is ask questions. So if you have questions, sponsors, MDL team, mentors, your fellow participants, your team, ask away. This is really about showcasing your talent and learning, right? It doesn't matter if you are brand, brand new to UI UX, you've never done any of this before and you've been thrown into the deep end, or if you know, you've been a professional in the industry for years. One of the most exciting things when it comes to UI UX is it develops incredibly fast, right? If you look at design trends, they, some people would say they even change like by yearly, they, like major shifts in design will change very, very quickly. Like right now we're still really big on the material trend, but a while back, I believe it was skew morphism that Apple was doing on like kind of the earlier generation of phones. And that was huge. That absolutely blew up. And now we're on kind of this like flat material look. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of transitions to dark mode stuff, especially in recent years. So with all of this, it changes really fast. There's a lot of really good stuff that you can learn and pull from. And so definitely ask around and see what other people have been up to. Um, so I'm just checking to see if there's any questions before I go and showcase final designs. So before I do that, any questions about anything I've presented, um, post them. Now's a great chance. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be showcasing uh, some of last year's winning designs talking about what they are doing, what they did really well, what I think they could have improved on. Um, and then at 1130, we're going to be having uh, my palette uh, come on and do a little bit of a talk about their capstone project that they did um, and sort of talking through how they design and how they think about these different aspects. Um, so I'm just seeing. Um, yes. so. The three judges, the, this is summary of how it works. The first round of judging is very much a round robin. So we try to get all the judges on the same page and then everyone goes and judges the different questions. And then at the end, what we do is we take kind of the top submissions, usually about 10 or so. And then we look at the scoring rankings and we make sure that there's no major discrepancies. You know, for, for the most part, we haven't had to really tweak anything. You know, sometimes you'll get two that are like neck and neck or like a point apart. And that's really the tiebreakers that it's meant to sort out. Um, so really what happens is you'll get judged by your three judges. And then if you make it into sort of those top levels of submissions, um, all the judges kind of sit down as a council and sort of go through the designs and decide if this is, you know, ranked at the appropriate spot or if it needs to be shifted in position. Um, so that's, uh, may we talk with business owners about a prototype? Um, confused as to what you mean by business owners. Uh, are you, if you're talking about like separate businesses, um, yes, you can showcase what you've done during this event. Um, okay. Uh, you can definitely showcase what you've done during this event. Uh, you know, you can put it on your profile. You can do all of that. I will, I would, you can't really be talking about people's idea, right? So I, I, I'm a little confused to what the, what the question you're asking is Alina. Um, but yeah, you can definitely showcase this on like your LinkedIn, GitHub, Dribble, uh, Behance showcase it on there 100%. Um, but yeah, so, oh, uh, I mean about the challenges who launched it. Yeah, you can you can definitely mention like, like, we're going to be mentioning that all these challenges were provided by, um, you know, the various partners and sort of what these partners do. Um, yeah, so if that's kind of what you're talking about, you're, you know, you want to be like, Oh, I did the uh, Invian problem, for example, which, which is a biotech firm that does um, natural product analysis with machine learning. And I helped to redesign a new front end for them. Um, that would be sort of 
you know, a really good example there. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to showcase things. Um, so we, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Sorry, it was hidden on my screen. Um, okay, so first thing I'm going to showcase are some of the uh, sticker challenges, just so that people kind of know like what we are expecting for those. Uh, so last year's themes, uh, we had the same album cover challenge. Uh, and we also had um, climate change as the sticker theme. So make a sticker about um, climate change. So this was the um, winning album cover, or we just thought that it ended up being really clean and actually really felt like something you could see as an album cover. Um, so we were pretty happy with that. We thought that was a really good submission. Uh, oh, Calvin wants on, uh, oh, uh, I can't, I can't let you on Calvin, um, because then you're going to be on video as well. Um, so we'll stop the broadcast relatively soon and we can check your stuff. Um, and then this was the winning, uh, sticker for the climate change challenge. So this is just to give you guys a bit of an idea of, you know, what those mini challenges have looked like in the past. Um, so keep that pretty short. Um, first one I want to talk through is uh i don't want to talk through that one i want to talk through this one okay so this was i believe first place in the app last year um so this was for global brigades which is a nonprofit organization at mcmaster that is part of sort of the larger global brigades organization um and they are focused on going to developing nations and helping to plan and engineer water systems for communities that need it. Um, it's different than some other organizations. It's really about building the scaffolding for people to kind of build themselves up. Uh, and it's about sort of sustainable communities and not so much about just kind of coming in and fixing the problem. So this is going to blaze through pretty fast, but I want to talk about some of the design decisions that we see and talk about why this, I believe this one won last year. Um, so, you know, we, we see a little bit of the artistic design coming in, right? They, these waves and whatnot, um, engineering brigades really is about sort of water and there was a flowiness in the design beforehand. So they kind of incorporated these components. They're using hues of the red, right? And, and it's like pretty, it looks pretty slick at the very start. Um, so less than a second and we're on to the first page why this design did so well this design rather than burying things in vertical menus did essentially a horizontal kind of roulette wheel so we are on the first page of that and to go between them it's either a swipe in one direction or a swipe in the other this made it so clean there was minimal scrolling for anything you could get to everything super, super fast. And you'll notice that the transition for this is really, really short. This team understood that you're gonna be swiping a lot. You're gonna be going through these components. You need a little something to guide the eye, but you gotta make it snappy. You can't have people like sitting there for a full one second transition. So you can see here, you know, they're meeting a lot of the components that were asked for in the design. These are all quick navigation links. Um, as well as underneath, you can see like progress bars. This is how far along you are. So this is a clever little interaction that is hidden within these. So this is an example of kind of a creative design in that respect. Um, and so I'm gonna keep going through. So if you click that donate button, that QR code appears. And the pitch for that was, you know, if you're at an event, someone wants to donate, you can quickly pull up that QR code and it takes them right to the donation site. And it actually did work when we tested it. Um, and then here's an example of the training. So we see the, everything is aligned really nicely, right? So, the, so when I was talking about like consistency in the design, then when we look here, we see you know, they have this outer section, which is always the same size. Um, and then everything is aligned um, horizontally. So everything here, right? None of these edges are jumping in or jumping out. 
So this is what we mean by a design that has consistency across it and is clean. So the, these are like the technical components that we're looking for. So going back, um, same thing with the buttons. So if you look at the edge space, right, it's the same on both, it doesn't change. And if you go between the designs, right, so you can see them, they're overlapped right now, right, you can see just the faintest image, they are the same size. It, this is consistency, right? It, anything that is horizontal in this bottom section has the same width right now. Like I, I just, I kind of want to point that out in terms of like consistency grows across a lot of elements of the design, not just one page in this case. Um, well, I skipped a whole bunch. Um, so this is how they did their drop down menus. So they did a little check mark if you did everything. Um, and then they had this arrow that would rotate it down and kind of show more items. And within that, uh, each, each of these were kind of like check radio boxes. Uh, so you click it and then it, you know, shows that, Hey, I, you've completed that component. Um, and then this, so you have the option of lorem ipsoning a lot of the text, um, which is okay for the layout. But if you really want to do stuff that is informed by the design, um, you know, having text that is relevant, that isn't just given to you, really helps uh, to elevate certain components. So when we're looking at um, like meeting the needs of the client, right, that's something that we're looking for. Professionalism, that's something that we're looking for. So if you can go above and beyond and have the time to go above and beyond, then feel free to add text and things that are relevant. Otherwise, or ipsum, don't waste the time on it. It's more important that the UI UX of it is done correctly rather than purely uh, the content side. So just hitting on that, you can go above and beyond like this, but lorem ipsum text, save yourself the time, get the UI UX right. Uh, so just want to go back there and really showcase that animation, right? So this is what I was talking about by an animation that is simple, fast, snappy. Another small detail, right? This is the error that we were talking about. Also, if you look at the very top, you can see that there is quick nav links that you can click. So because most of the interaction is the swiping, Meaning, you know, it's not that big of a deal. If the only interaction that they had was you had to click on the top to go through, then we would have deducted points. But you'll notice because they shift the quick links to down here, right on the main page, they get rid of that bar at the top. So this is little details that we want you to think about, right? You don't need two quick nav bars because all these are for quick navigation. So get rid of the one at the top, clean up the design. And, and then when those quick navs kind of in this bottom section go away to be replaced by content, put the bar at the top. Um, and so uh, there's the example of the error, right? So it shows this kind of warning sign. And this is what we're talking about when we say, you know, are you thinking of what happens when it comes to errors? You know, are you showcasing that? Um, and then looking at things like, oh, the waiver is incomplete the um you know the disclosure form is pending it still needs approval you know everything else has been approved so this is what we mean by thinking about those different aspects and making sure that you account for those you know and here's an example of one where you have a bunch of incomplete um records and they thought ahead and they said how are we going to record these because we can't just record oh i went to the doctors so these photo icons, if you click it, would actually pull up your camera uh, and you'd be able to quickly take a photo and that way you have it on record. Um, I believe that's the end of this one. So that is an example of an app that did really, really well last year. Um, how long does the recording have to be? Yeah, so the recording can be as long as uh, you want it to be. The, uh, this team did it super, super snappy in like 17 seconds. It's a little fast, um, you know, we had one team in like someone went through and I think they recorded like a seven minute, like narrated video that was really in depth. And 
unfortunately that I don't think that team ended up placing, but it was like the best video produced. It was just mo most of that team, I believe, was fairly new to UI UX. I think they only had like one or two people that were like pretty, pretty versed in it because uh, they were a team of four. So when it comes to that, um, you know, again, make our lives easy. You make sure you go through all aspects of the prototype because we're not going to be able to mark you guys on things that you can't see. So, you know, if at the very start of your video, just include like a three second still of your um, flow diagrams and of your uh, wireframes. So I don't have time to showcase um, other apps. I want to showcase a user flow diagram and I want to showcase um, a, uh, ja -ja 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 -ja. what are we? wanted to showcase a user flow diagram and a wireframe, just so that people know what I'm talking about when I mention that. Um, so, is it, uh, here it is. Okay, I, I have the two of them. Sorry, I'm like just rushing to get this in before Calvin takes over um, and they start their next round of presentation. Okay, this is a wireframe. Um, so, what is a wireframe? A wireframe is a basic outline of what your app should look like. This is a pretty in-depth one, actually. Um, does not have to be this formal. You can do it by hand. You can do it in software. You can do it wherever. But it is how it is going to look. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? You see, like, all the text is lorem ipsum. Um, you know, just basic sketches of how it's going to look before you do your Figma, before you do your XD, you know, plan your stuff out. It's really cheap to do this in terms of time. Your Figmas, your XDs, then you're tweaking things, you're manipulating things. That eats up a lot of time. So this is what we are talking about by a wireframe. Doesn't have to be this formal, doesn't have to be this nice. This is one I found online, right? But it's mainly to show the idea of laying out everything you know, and you can see here, they thought of different modes. So we have the browser on the left, we have the tablet portrait in the middle, and then mobile on the right. So if you are thinking of a multifaceted design, right, you're accounting for more than one uh, size, really good way to kind of show that. And even if you aren't accounting for more than one size in your final Figma or XD, show us this anyways, right? Like if I receive this as a wireframe, this is probably getting like out of the wireframe marking for the planning is probably getting all the points. Um, you know, so this would be really, really highly rated. So put in different sizes, make sure that you lay things out, feel free to just lorem ipsum text, don't waste time on it. Um, okay, final thing, because I know Calvin is going to take over uh, any second now. Um, oh, where did I put it? I lost it. Um, uh, let's close this. Is it going to let me showcase? It's not going to let me showcase. Okay. Here. I'm just going to do this. Um, okay. Uh, how does that look on Hop then? I just zoomed into the abyss. Okay. I'm going to assume that everybody can at least kind of sort of see this. This is a user flow diagram. Uh, this was for um, Fleet which was a startup that joined us uh, for last year's competition. Um, and this is uh, actually, sorry, this was for the National Design League website, my bad. Um, and so they've attended again this year. Uh, they're kind of our parent guys. Uh, and this is an example of the process that a user could go through. And so this is another really important thing that you should be submitting, um, right? So if I want to attend an event, okay, so I go to the attend page, I can either do events, online courses or design challenges. And then I get taken to the register page. Okay, so I can go back now to the home page. I want to go to my student, you know, I want to go see other students. Okay, I can go to the students page and go to the about page and go to the job page, right? I can view and apply to different jobs, uh, sponsorships, um, <laughs> you know. So it's okay if stuff isn't um, like a thousand percent done, right? But this is what we want to see. We really want to see that you thought about this and you planned it and you're not just going by the seat of your pants. You know, we really want to make sure that everyone is 
thinking about these components and we know that five minutes is not a lot of time and we know it's hard to communicate all that, but at least show us that you, you know, put in the planning and we can kind of mark for that. I'm being told that time is up. Um, I just want to say thank you all for coming out to this talk. I hope it was kind of informative. Uh, I'm going to be signing off and then uh, in about a minute or so, the My Palant team is coming on and they're going to be talking about their capstone project. So look forward to that. Um, otherwise, I will be seeing everyone around the event.